We're going to continue with our probability definitions today, starting with independent events. Two events are independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the chances of the other. Now, in most cases, this is really obvious, okay? It, if I've got, you know, here I've got a dice, and oh, I've got to have, there we go, and a quarter. And I really want to roll a five on the dice. So I'm like, okay, well, heads are lucky. Since I flipped a head on this coin, I now have a better chance of getting a five, right? <laughs> so the flipping of the coin does not affect the chances of me getting a five on the dice. Now, as if I show it in that way, it becomes really obvious, okay? But if you took a coin and flipped it three times, it is possible to get heads three times in a row. If I flip it a fourth time, what's my probability of getting tails? Is it increased because I haven't got a tails yet and it's supposed to be 50-50? Or is it decreased because this, this coin is just naturally uh, un... Well, it's still a fair coin, but is it just like naturally on a roll so it's going to keep going heads just because of what happened in the past? And a lot of people have this as a misunderstanding because now we're talking about the same coin going forward. That next coin flip is still 50-50, right? If you flipped heads 22 times in a row, super unlikely. It's about the same odds as winning the lottery. If you flip a coin 22 times in a row and you're like, okay, I've done heads 22 times in a row, I'm going to go for 23. Some people would say, oh, it's not, since 23 is so unlikely, it's going to be like a 0% chance of getting it that 23rd time but it's still back to 50% because the flip from before doesn't affect the next flip and that's an independent event. So when a dice is rolled and a coin is tossed, these events would be independent because one doesn't affect the other. We have some mathematical rules. The first one is the product rule. When you're trying to find the probability of two independent events, you can just find the probability of one and multiply it by the probability of the other. So here's our first example. Card is randomly chosen and a dice is thrown once. Find the probability that it's the jack of spades and a five is thrown. Well, those don't affect each other so your chances of getting the jack are 1 out of 52. The chances of getting your 5 are 1 out of 6. So the chances of both of those things happening are 1 out of 312. And you can just multiply the probabilities together. bag contains three red and two white marbles. Another bag contains one red and four white marbles. A ball is selected at random from each bag. Find the probability that both marbles are red. So the first thing we have to decide is, does one event affect the other event? No. How could we make this question so that it did affect the other event? Well, you could have only one bag of marbles, and you pull one out and you don't put it back in. Now the probability when you go to your second marble changes because there's less marbles in there. But in this case, there are independent. So our notation, we want to find probability of red. Here's our symbol for and red. and bag on <laughs> has three out of five red and the second bag has one out of five being red so our total chances 
are 3 out of 25. The marbles are different colors. How could that happen? And be careful in how you explain this to me. Red one, then white, or white one, then red. So I would write that this is the probability of getting red and then white plus the probability of getting white and then red. And both of those are independent, so red and then white. Oops, second one has four white ones. Or getting white to begin with. And then red. Add those together. Now, when you get the word at least in a question, at least on marble, boy, we're really going good here with the word on, at least one marble is white. You could break this up into cases like we did in part B and think about what are the situations that we could have. We could have red and then white, white and then red, or white and white. So if we wanted to use part B, all we'd have to figure out was what's the probability of getting both white ones and add it to what we had before. Yes. And the other possibility is to do the opposite. What's the opposite of getting at least one white marble? Two red ones, no white marbles. We already know that the complement of one white marble is two red marbles, and so we can go 100% or 1 minus 3 out of 25. 1 is 25 out of 25, would leave me with 25 out of 25 that have at least one white marble. Probability, and you can even write it out in words. Had we done it the other way, had we figured out the probability of white and white, well, white in the first one is 2 out of 5, and white in the second one is 4 out of 5, that would give us 8 out of 25. Can you see that if you add this 8 out of 25 to the 14 out of 25 we found in part B, we also get 22 out of 25. So in this situation, I don't find that one of these ways was faster than the other because of the, what we'd already figured out in B. But had this been the only question you were asked in this one, then using the complement is a better strategy because there's less things to figure out. And the complement, sometimes it is easier to count what is not true than it is to count all the cases of something being true. And you saw that last year in which unit? Permutations. Remember all those permutation questions? So this unit of probability connects to that a fair bit. Two fair four-sided dice are thrown. Have you ever seen a four-sided dice? OK, I think I might even have one. Yes, I do. They are the worst dice to sit on or to step on. There they are. Anybody know what this shape is called? Tetrahedron. Yes. Don't sit or step on them. And they're really kind of annoying because you roll them and you're like, ooh, the pointy side's up. You roll it again. Ooh. The pointy side's up. <laughs> and so I don't know what game you need the pointy side up. 
to be up, but it's quite likely it will happen that way. Not wanting to go away. There we go. If we draw out all the possibilities of a four-sided dice and the sums that you could get, this is a very helpful strategy for us to visualize what's happening. Event A, the sum of the two dice is six. I've circled those in red. Event B, the number on both dice is the same. I've circled those in purple. Find the probability of A and B. So in this case, we're looking at our diagram. What are the chances of getting that the sum is 6 and that the number on both dices are the same? Well, the only way that happens is the one number that's circled in both colors. Remember, and means both situations have to occur. Find the probability of A or B. Well, in A or B, we count up all of the events that are either the sum is a 6 or that the two dice are the same. Now, the sum that it's a 6 happens three times. The probability of the dice are the same happens four times. Why is it 6 out of 16 and not 7 out of 16? That's right. We double counted that six. If we count the purple separately, there's four purples. The red separately, there's three reds. But we double counted one. So when we find the probability of A or B, we'd have to either from here just count that one once, or do you remember the addition rule from the other day? And when you drew your Venn diagram for or, if, let's see, I'm going to pick this pen, make it thicker, right, I did this before, a little bit transparent. If I count all of this one, and then I count all of this one, that middle section gets a little bit darker because you counted it twice. And so you'd have to subtract that middle section once, and that's your addition rule for A or B. In this case, you probably just counted to get 6, but if you counted them separately, 3 plus 4 minus the 1 in the middle would give us 6 in total. Are the events mutually exclusive, independent, or neither? So mutually exclusive, do you remember what that means? If I draw it with a Venn diagram? Mutually exclusive is like one circle here, one circle here, right? Two events that cannot occur at the same time. Are you under the age of 20 or over the age of 50? You can't be both at the same time. Very hard. Ooh, or you could be born on a leap year and technically you're only 18, but really you're 57. I don't know. Something like that. If they are mutually exclusive, the probability of A and B has to be zero because there would be no overlap in between them. But since the probability of A and B is figured out to be 1 over 16, they are not mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive is fairly easy to describe. And this Part C is a typical kind of thinking question that the exam will put on. They'll put a, a question like this, and then you have to think, are these events independent, mutually exclusive, or not? No. For independent, if two things are independent, 
then the probability of A and B equals the probability of A times the probability of B. So this is an important idea for independence. We know that the probability of A and B is 1 over 16. We can figure out both the probability of A and the probability of B separately. 3 out of four, 16 and 4 out of 16. And if we multiply them, we get 3 out of 64, but that does not equal 1 out of 16. So they are not independent.